let's talk about the one of the most common forms of interaction uh, that there is, and that's business to consumer. And um, it is a very relevant topic these days because even before the Corona crisis, the stores that were selling products physically and that people go to were declining. You will see in city centers that a lot of chains uh, like V&D in the Netherlands uh, or Blocker are struggling or even didn't survive uh, already. So in these times, these physical stores struggle even harder. Um, so what we call these physical stores that are only selling products in stores that you have to go through physically is what we call the brick and mortar uh, business model. So it relies on customers coming to the store and buying products. Uh, those could before be example often be re, uh, like uh, discount stores where a lot of products are offered the assortment changes quickly and people are there buying you know in bulk or they're buying uh, additional doing upselling this they, they buy additional products so these stores do really well on the other end of the spectrum you have really high-end stores where you go for a certain experience so stores where you would pay premium fee, where would you go through physically because they render certain services or they have certain niche project products that, you, that are hard to find online or things that you need to fit and so on. So those stores that you physically go through, like the Action in the Netherlands or used to go through physically are called brick and mortar business models. On the other, uh, the other end of that spectrum, you have click only. So uh, those are stores that have no, you know, product web shops, uh, other firms that don't have a physical presence. Uh, those firms are, for example, Zalando, um, uh, Bol.com. So those are stores that only exist online. Of course, they have warehouses, but as a consumer, all your interaction with them is through a website or some other digital or remote uh, system. Uh, so those stores or firms that follow that concept of not having a physical presence are called click only. Nowadays, the lines between the two are blurring, especially those stores that were only brick and mortar are now transitioning to at least also including a digital uh, presence. And those hybrid forms we call click and mortar. Um, click and mortar means that there are stores still there with a physical presence, but they are also uh, available online. Uh, when you talk about click and mortar, you can think in the Netherlands, for example, about Cool Blue. Cool Blue is essentially well known for the web shop, but they also have physical stores. On the other hand, a lot of stores that were previously only physical are now offering online as well, like Blocker, for example. And within click and mortar, there could still be a difference. Uh, for some companies, uh, that have transitioned from brick and mortar to click and mortar, they may still rely a lot on uh, their main revenue coming from the physical stores. And the web uh, part of that is often an addition for them or uh, used for marketing or to draw the audience in. But for some stores, uh, the click and mortar is an addition. Uh, the, the web shop is an addition to their physical stores. So they have transitioned from purely physical stores to also physical stores with an online presence. And the revenue may initially still be on the physical stores and is slowly shifting towards the uh, online sales. You also have stores that have started purely as a web-based uh, store and are shifting towards physical stores like Cool Blue. And the main concept here for them, the motivation is, uh, by having a physical store helps with the branding, helps customers to get familiar with the products because some customers and for some customers and or for some products, they don't feel comfortable ordering online and they like to go to a store to see what the new TV looks like, uh, try on clothes or uh, get a feel for certain things or just like advice from somebody in person. So those 
online stores, you will see they have pop-up stores, uh, pop-up stores, which are temporary locations that are being opened or really open physical stores. So they transition from the online presence only, the click only to uh, physical, they add physical stores to it. So they transition towards click and mortar. For them, the main revenue is still the click uh, only, the online presence, the web shops, but they are using, they are investing, even if they might lose money over it, uh, purely on the shops, they, they use them to extend their business, to extend their services. And think back about the previous lecture when we talked about competitive advantage, such stores give a competitive advantage over your, cost, over your competitors because you can offer a differential strategy. You can offer a service, you can offer advice to your customers that even if your prices are higher, people are willing to pay that in return for the services you offer. Uh, it can be tricky though, because the risk is that people will go to a store, compare products, get the advice, get the information and get the services and will go home and then start comparing different online shops to see which is the cheapest one, which may not be yours. So that is a risk, although there is this tendency of people to feel a buy-in. Once you've been to a store, you, you've, you've used time of a customer representative or a salesperson that is helping you, that's assisting you, uh, people feel this connection and there is a little bit of a barrier to transition to one of the other shops to buy a product from the competitors. Um, so anyway, it is a strategy that is, or at least was happening uh, a lot. Another advantage of this e-commerce, in, in addition to transitioning from a physical store to an online store, reaching a, a bigger audience, is that you can also start offering specific services. If you go to a store, uh, you first of all have to go physically there, which is a barrier. Uh, you can do uh, online stores, you can visit from the comfort of your home, you can visit them from wherever, whenever you like. Um, so that's a big advantage. Another advantage is that online stores can offer a lot more. Um, they can offer you to customize your products, for example. If you go to a physical store and you buy a product there, only what they have in stock in that specific store in that specific configuration is what you could buy. But if you're ordering online, a, a company could you know, offer a lot more options to you. They can offer more products because they don't need a physical store to store them. They can store them in a warehouse somewhere remotely where the ground or the rent is much cheaper. You can use the space more efficiently, but they can also work directly with their suppliers down the supply chain. And for example, allow customers to indicate their preferences and customize their products to their needs. So if you would ever be in the, in the, you know, interested in buying a Tesla, for example, or nowadays most other cars, you would go to a website and you can configure the product to your um, choice. So electronic commerce makes it a lot easier for people to adapt a product to indicate their preferences and guide people through this process of customizing the product to their wishes. Um, of course, a physical store you know, could do that for you. Uh, but essentially, if you would buy a product straight from the store, you could only buy the configurations they have available to you unless they start ordering it as well. And then you might as well do that yourself directly. So they call that mass customization. Um, so it allows you, it allows the masses to customize the products to the need within certain parameters, of course. Um, so there's a lot of uh, options for that. Um, you saw Tesla, you can do the same with M&Ms, especially in the United States. You can pretty much select any color you like. You can change the logos, you can put text on it. All these things that a store cannot directly do for you. And you can go online, you can configure your product, in this case, M&Ms or other candy to your exact specifications. And the same applies to uh, slippers. Uh, you can um, configure the color, the straps, all these things. So this is, again, a service made possible because technology uh, makes it possible for you to customize it. it. It fits into the production processes of a company. Uh, but most of all, 
it gives a competitive advantage. It sets you out from your competitors because people can customize it. Um, you, you can adapt to the wishes and the needs of your customers supported by information and communication technology. So what is that um, advantage that mass customization gives? Well, first of all, you can do, uh, you can get more profit from it. Uh, because as you customize things, people will be willing to pay a higher price for it because the product better suits the needs. The more closer you can get to the needs of the customer, the higher the price the customer is willing to pay in it. So from one product, you can actually produce more profit because uh, the profit is better tailored, so you can charge a higher price. At the same time, you, you don't run the risk of producing surpluses. Let's imagine that, for example, you would be producing a cars like Tesla's and rather than allowing people to configure it on your website, you produce based on some marketing, which colors will be preferential for people. The risk is that with that assessment and when you start producing, you start supplying uh, um, stores that people might prefer a different color than what your marketing has said or preferences have changed which means that there will be a surplus of cars that people don't want to buy the color they don't like and a shortage of the color they do like. Now with this, with this customization, you run less of that risk because every product will be specified to the needs of the customer. So there will be a closer fit to the demands and what you're producing, which means that you will have, you will have less overhead and less stock of products that don't fit the needs. So, Overall, you will have a higher profit because you will have less stock and less products that are not being sold. And finally, because you mass customize, you might also reach customers who previously were not interested in your products because it didn't fit their needs. So uh, you will also increase your market share because people who were looking for specific properties and were shopping with the, with the competitors might not be drawn to you because now they're able to configure something to their needs. So imagine that you can charge a higher price because you can, uh, because people are willing to pay a higher price for something that fits their needs. You will have less surplus of stock because what you produce will be closer to the actual needs in total of the customers. So less stock. And finally, you will reach new customers because uh, you will have more to offer tailored to their needs. So those are some examples and some benefits of mass customization. Now, another example that happens uh, with e-commerce is called disintermediation. Uh, going again back to the example of Tesla, before you used to go buy a car at a dealership, which means that you would travel there, you would have a talk with a, with a sales representative, and that sales representative would either sell you a car or order the car for you from a supplier. So there would be somewhere between you and the manufacturer of the car. And the more people are in between you and the manufacturer, the more, the higher the margins will be because every intermediary has to, of course, also earn a profit and make sure their business stays afloat. So with every intermediary, every step, every transaction that's being added after production and between you as the final consumer is an additional margin. Now, before those distribution channels, those intermediaries were needed because people would need to physically go to a store. So the more stores you had, the easier it was for people to find your products and a sales representative that could convince them. But that's actually not necessary anymore these days. If you want to buy a bike, you can buy them directly from the manufacturer. Um, you, if you know what you want and that's where the stores come into play. But if you know what you want, you can often procure things directly from a manufacturer these days, which means for a manufacturer that they will be closer to the customer. There's less risk of overproducing, as I said before, of the wrong models. We'll come back to that a little bit later in supply chains. Uh, that's called a potential risk, the bullwhip effect. But anyway, because you can buy directly from the producer, you will have uh, you will have less people in between, which means that there, there will be less margins added and the product will be cheaper, more cheaper available to you, will be more cheap. Um, so that 
process of directly going to the supplier is called disintermediation, removing intermediaries from the supply chain and the process and reducing the margins. Finally, an added, uh, another, well, final or one more benefit of e-commerce is the possibility for e-tailing. And e-tailing means that you're addressing niche markets. Uh, if you talk about stores, physical stores, those stores have certain costs. Having a store in a city center or in a shopping mall is expensive. You need to pay rent, you need to pay staff there, uh, you need to buy products, you need to maintain the store, uh, you back pay uh, taxes and so on. So because you have that store, you need to make sure that you turn a certain profit. And to do that, a certain profit, you need to sell products and probably you need to sell a lot of products or charge high, very high uh, premiums. So what are you going to do to make sure you, you reach those profits is sell products you know there is a demand for. The higher the demand, the more things you can sell or the higher the price you can sell things. So essentially, people are going to focus stores on what is mainstream. So that is because for mainstream, we know there is a demand. We know those products will sell. Um, and that's necessary because you have this store and you have this limited space and you need to sell these things. Um, with online, a lot of these uh, things uh, are less important because you can store, you can build warehouses in places where the ground is cheap, you pay less rent. You don't need to hire sales representatives um, so it is cheaper and you can have more products. Um, so e-commerce allows companies to focus on these niche. So you, you don't need, uh, you can sell much wider variety of products. If you look at bol.com or Amazon, you will see that there is a lot of different kinds of products that they offer. Um, so you also need to worry less aside from the physical place you need to store products, you also need to worry less about the sales because you reach essentially for e-commerce the whole world, which means even if there is a niche uh, product with a limited customer uh, market for it, normally you would only reach them within your ge own geographical area and the number would be low. But now because you can reach everyone around the world who is interested in that niche market, that market all of a sudden becomes an interesting one. So um, you reach a lot more people. So that gives you the benefit uh, of addressing a niche market and still be able to reach enough customers to make to turn a profit. Um, and finally, you have low overhead, as I mentioned before. So uh, those are three benefits you can you don't need a store size, a, a specific store with shelf space where things are on display. So you can sell, you can have a lot more products. Secondly, you can address a lot of people uh, worldwide. So even for a niche market, being able to address more people um, makes, it an uh, makes it worthwhile. And because you sell online, you can also be more efficient. You don't need to hire staff for sales. Uh, you can uh, you know, work with, low vo with high volumes and low overhead. So allows you to do competitive pricing. The downside of online when it comes to niche markets and to some extent online sales in general is that you that there is limited trust. Um, often with a niche, especially if it's a company that's less known, uh, people don't trust it. People like to know the organization and going to a physical store shows that people have invested. You can talk to somebody. So the trust is higher especially if it's a niche and new thing, although people nowadays get more used to it. Uh, for some products, people also like to be able to physically handle the product, see it, touch it, and have a direct experience with it. And that is also something that a physical store offers over a purely online store. And finally, if you talk about uh, after sales care, such as the delivery of products, being able to return or get a product directly, Physical stores also there have an advantage. Um, it's easier to return something to a physical store than being going back to the post office, uh, writing down the address, uh, packaging it again, putting a sticker on it and shipping it. 
Um, it's easier to take the broken product to a store and get it serviced rather than sending it and waiting it for it to return. So those are some downsides of e-commerce and specifically on niche products. Um, so once you have, you know, these, this uh, idea or this drive to do e-commerce, let's talk a little bit about, uh, besides the products and services, how you can look at marketing and how you would design websites or what things you should consider when you start offering your products and services online.